something to be said about just not buying into that mindset that like you have to suffer in order to be successful because as the masters teach like every moment that you're not happy it's just a lost moment that's it you're never going to get that moment back and so it's like why couldn't i just cultivate like true blissful happiness in every moment regardless of the situation and see the beauty in like sitting across from this beautiful soul here doing a podcast like blessed with everything and and be in that energy all the time and then letting they say like you have to let the other stuff that comes up like fall to the wayside I'm Matt Maruka, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. Welcome back to the Lifestylist. This is episode 419. It's called Let There Be Light, How to Illuminate Consciousness and Biology with Matt Maruka. Show notes with links, video, and transcripts for this episode can be found at lukestory.com slash light diet. Let's go ahead and intro our guest who, frankly, if you're a longtime listener, needs no further introduction. But for those of you new to Matt, he first appeared on the show a few years back when I met him in New York City. He was only 19 at the time and quickly became a listener favorite and, in fact, one of my top downloads for quite a few years after. Well, Matt's come a long way. He's now the founder and CEO of Raw Optics, which teaches people about the important roles that light plays in health and develops the most advanced light therapy-based product for transforming health. Learning the biology of light led Matt to the discovery that we are beings of light, which helped him learn to let go of being sick as an aspect of his identity, and further propelled him on a spiritual journey to realize the unlimited nature of our human experience. Now, to be honest, this was a really tough episode to tee up here in the intro, as Matt and I covered such a wide spectrum of topics. So I'll drop a couple hints here, but for now, I just recommend diving in as we traverse a lot of interesting territory around personal growth, spirituality, and entrepreneurship. That said, a few of the topics covered include Matt's experience founding a startup as a young person, how Matt came across the final piece of the light diet, holding yourself back due to fear of causing jealousy in others, the lie that our worth is based on what we do, letting everything inside us that isn't love die the importance of healing ourselves to become living examples for others, craving the unknown instead of shying away from it, and the massive difference having an anchor can make in the life of a nomad. Because if you know Matt and his work, uh, he just travels the globe and runs his company and does his thing. It's pretty fascinating. We talk a lot about how he's able to do that and still uh, maintain his life. If you want to check out Matt's blue blocking eyewear line, go to lukestory.com slash raw optics. That's R A O P. T-I-C-S and use the code over there for 10% off. All right, let's hit it head first with Matt Maruka. Hope you dig it. Hot damn, dude, here we are. Here we are. I, I was so excited to hear that you were going to be in Austin for Paleo FX and I told uh, Bailey over here, shout out to Bailey Richardson, what? Um, and thank you for introducing me to Bailey, by the way. My honor. My incredible uh, show producer and assistant extraordinaire. But I was like, man, we got to record with Matt because you're so nomadic. I will never be able to catch you. You're in like Turkey one day and then Costa Rica the next. <laughs> like I've never seen anyone, especially your age, travel as much as you do. So I'm like, we got to sit down and catch up. Uh, so what's the latest and greatest? Where, where did you come from before you got here to Austin? So I was just in San Diego for a little while uh, visiting some friends. My mother's been staying out there. So hanging out in Encinitas, really beautiful town. Before that, I was in Miami. So I was there only a week. Uh, before that, I was in Miami for about 10 days for the Bitcoin conference, Bitcoin 2022, which is something we could also get into a little bit on this on this chat. Really interesting subject, Bitcoin is, if, if you're not already super familiar, but it to me is the future of money and the future of freedom. And I can only give a cursory explanation, but I feel that the way I might be able to explain it similarly to light would resonate with many people who can't get it when, let's say, a hardcore Bitcoiner starts explaining it. Cool. So let's that'd be fun. That. And and then uh, before Miami, I was in Costa Rica, good old Costa Rica for two months, just surfing away. And, and before that, I was in Germany and before that, Switzerland and before that, Norway and before that, Italy through the, the winter. So I went, if you can imagine, from the you know opportunity to be in sunny places to really cold places for the winter starting with russia in september and then through europe and it was really cool i had been craving winter for years 
being in this sort of ever summer time. And it was really refreshing actually to have a really true winter in Norway in January. The days were about five hours long. (laughs) (laughs) It was really interesting. Yeah, it's been been quite the ride. Wow. So you uh, started this company shortly after we met years ago in in New York City on that fateful day. You started your company, Raw Optics. Uh, Those watching the video, he's wearing them right now. And were instrumental in helping me launch my brand, Gilded. Uh, So thank you for the recommendation on manufacturing and making sure that they were scientifically awesome. Uh, But you started that company, and unlike most people I know that, um, you know, had a startup, generally they're building a team and getting office space and kind of scaling in a brick and mortar sort of situation. And the whole time I've known you and watched your company grow, and you've done such an incredible job with the product development and the marketing and all the things. But yet every time I see you on Instagram, you're like surfing in Costa Rica. I'm like, how is this kid doing that? You know, as someone who's uh, run a couple companies, uh, I never managed to get away from my computer for more than a couple hours a day, if that. So what's it like being a nomadic entrepreneur? And what are, what are the systems that you use? Or um, how do you do it? Dude, you're the best, first of all. I just have to say so. I think it's a great time to recount a little bit of the story of how the business came into existence at, so as to sort of inspire people and, and have a context for how things came to be. And that will answer Let's do that. most of the questions. So, you know, to just run through for people who want like the full detail and more in that time, they can go back to listen to the original Extreme Biohacking Millennial Edition episode. But I would just recap and, and basically, you know, say when I was growing up, I had a great life, great childhood, but had some health challenges. Uh, You know, so I didn't inquire though. It was just, I accepted it. And then by the time I got to high school and I had these really debilitating headaches, gut issues, allergies, like every day, I was, it was just bringing me down. But that wasn't enough for me to look for a solution. I was fully accepting that it was genetic and I couldn't do anything. But then I started getting really bad breakouts of acne. And that was like, no, because you're 14 years old. You want to meet girls and look good. And it's like, you don't want to look covered in pimples and stuff. So I started reading. Paleo diet came up, uh, how to improve my skin health and overall health with food. And I learned about the Whole30 cleanse somehow. And I was like, can't afford this Whole30 program. But then I found, oh, it's the same thing as the paleo diet. Basically, they just charge for it. So then I started reading everything I could. And I I ran across Mark Sisson's blog and he wrote about this term epigenetics. And I was like, wait a minute, like our genes aren't just our blueprint for life. Like we can actually turn certain genes on and off based on our environment slash lifestyle choices. Like that's, that's really profound. Like I didn't know that. I thought my genes were just my thing. My mom had allergies, so I have allergies and I can't do anything about it. That was just what I accepted. And when I went out to all the doctors through those previous years, it was like, you have gut issues, take Tums from the gastro doctor. You have headaches, the pediatrician says, take Advil. And you have uh, horrible allergies, the allergist says, take all these like Claritin, you know, Zyrtec, all this stuff. And it just never, ever did anything because it was all just symptom level stuff. So anyhow, the, the whole situation advanced where I got obsessed with paleo, went all in and I got a benefit. So I was like, these guys must be right. Like Mark Sisson's contention that it's 80% about food and 20% about everything else. Like I fully believe that that was the truth. So I went all in on food, all in on diet. I went from the paleo diet to the autoimmune paleo diet because I thought, well, if paleo works like 50 to 60% for me, autoimmune paleo should knock out the rest because then I cut out those trigger foods that are according to this theory, which I'd like to ex- explicate how I feel the theory is flawed. But these, you cut out these trigger foods is the idea. And then your body was supposedly going to heal itself, but they never actually ever spoke about what in the body leads it to heal itself. Like, so the idea is you, again, you take out all these trigger foods with the paleo diet and then magically you get better, but they never talk about the magic. They never talk about what's causing the body to heal ever, ever. And so then autoimmune is like, well, if you're not fully healed from just paleo, then you should go autoimmune paleo. You should take everything else out, all the nightshades and the nuts and seeds and anything else that could possibly inflame the diet. And the furthest extreme of that thinking is the carnivore diet. So I ended up doing autoimmune paleo, 
Then I went on to the gut and psychology syndrome, the GAPS diet, which they use for like autistic children. And uh, anyway, I was eating only well-cooked meats and well-cooked vegetables, and that was it. And I actually was feeling worse and worse and worse because I was buying more and more into an energy of victimhood and stress, which I think is all too common now with people doing diets. But while we're on the subject, and, and we will get in, of course, to the story of the business and how it started in the entrepreneurship, but I think it's worth, now that we've hit this point, to touch on just how significant it is that none of these diets take the time to explain what's doing the healing. So for example, the carnivore diet is, has grown to extreme proportions. It's become super compelling as like one of the number one diets today. Like it's probably taken the place of what the paleo diet was five years ago. Like everyone like, let's go carnivore, you know, full keto. And so the idea with carnivore is that basically, you know, the body is assaulted by plant toxins. So when you eat plant toxins, they basically activate the immune system and then, you know, they, act, they, they damage the gut, they activate the immune system, the plants are trying to defend themselves. And then the whole body gets into this inflammatory cascade where if you have an underlying autoimmune condition, those plants actually like either activate your immune, your immune system and trigger your autoimmune disease. And they go so far as to actually say that the plants themselves cause the autoimmune disease by constantly creating a leaky gut and inflammation. Now, on the surface, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But the thing that really struck me was like, well, how are there all these carnivore people who are like, they say that they're like healed by the carnivore diet. And yet, like if they eat a blueberry or a sweet potato or a piece of broccoli, like they're in, they're in total immune system flares out of proportion and their body goes into a, a crazy haywire state and, and they're sick. It's like, in my evaluation, I was like, if you can't eat something humans have eaten for thousands of years with relatively robust health, you know, the whole idea is like, oh, humans have been going downhill since the agricultural revolution and we should all go back in time and go back. To me, I don't think that's actually true anymore. A lot of the, the things I believed about paleo, I think humans have been evolving mentally, physically, arguably not, but mentally and spiritually for sure. And a lot of the calls to go back to a primal living is actually calls for like de-evolution. That's probably a controversial claim, but not that there's nothing valuable about looking at ancestral wisdom. Of course, I believe there is. Like that's what I'm all about, light, getting back to nature and circadian rhythms. But specifically on carnivore, it was clear to me like if your body is still reacting to blueberries and sweet potatoes and any plant toxin, like you're not healed. You're just not. You think you're healed, but you've just, you've done exactly what you said you were going against Western medicine to do. You've done, you've said Western medicine's a problem because you're, it's only addressing the symptoms and you're not healing the fundamental cause. Well, you've removed all the foods that activate your symptoms. You've done the exact same thing that Western medical drugs do just with food instead of drugs. You haven't healed. And so for me, that's a very, very profound thing because it's like everyone's being in my opinion, bamboozled by the idea of the carnivore diet that you're actually healing. It's like, no, and no one ever speaks about, so the idea is you remove these plant toxins for long enough, uh, even sometimes permanently, but in the autoimmune diet, it's that you remove them for a certain period of time and then somehow, but no one ever, ever answered or even asked how the body heals itself. It's like, well, shouldn't we talk about that? Like, what if you could just access the energy responsible for the healing of the body. Maybe you wouldn't need to cut all the foods out. Now, you might imagine that I'm going somewhere with this towards Joe Dispenza and the teachings of spirit and energy because the more I've learned about light, the, the food, so circling it all back, the food worked, but only partially. The autoimmune, the stricter diets, they worked, but only partially. And then I learned about Dr. Jack Cruz, good you know, buddy of both of ours and really intelligent guy. And something just resonated deeply because, you know, a friend of mine described it as like, you have a truth bell going off in your heart when you find something. And I, there was a truth bell going off. Now, there were certain things that I don't believe every single thing Jack teaches to be true, but like vast majority, really on point. So I read all these books that we spoke about on the, you know, earlier podcasts about energy and this and that and all this stuff. And Dr. Robert O'Becker in The Body Electric, he exposes that this bo the body is a electromagnetic system. And then, you know, I came across Ram Das and Be Here Now and all these spiritual ideas. And I was like, this is just sounds like super interesting. Like I would never have bought into any of this, like let's say woo-woo from Ram Das if it weren't for 
this idea of bioelectromagnetism and photobiology from Dr. Cruz, but I was open to it. So I was like, this makes some sense. There could be something here. Years went by, I ran the business and we'll get into that a little bit. But um, I was still so stressed, like even though like, okay, I might've been on Instagram in Costa Rica or like, you know, they joke like your Instagram is like showing your good side of your life. Like life may have looked really good and the podcast, like I was sharing the things we were talking about and sharing were, were and still are very valuable truths about light and circadian rhythms. But there was something that like I hadn't gotten. Uh, I hadn't figured it out. And it was, I was so, so stressed and so like uh, struggling. that I was like, there's no way that I, that my light diet, let's say this protocol is fully accurate. Because if it were, I would feel like whole. I'd feel the way I want to feel and I didn't feel it yet. So that's when I finally had recalling these spiritual inclinations and these energy books I finally was like, all right, I need to find someone who I can lean all in on, who I, who I really trust. They're not a charlatan. And if I put my energy into their teachings, it's, I'm going to get a result because I don't want to waste a year of my life with a charlatan, right? And that's when I finally realized like, you know what? Joe Dispenza, like that name has come up five times. I've seen him on podcasts. I listen to his podcast with Aubrey, listen to his podcast with you. And I was like, this guy, he's got it. Like it just, my truth bell was like Joe Dispenza. So I started going into his work and and his work's unbelievable. Like it was the first time in my life that I realized that I was responsible for all of my suffering, 100%. Like I was playing the story of the victim. I was playing the story of like, I can't do this or like this is stressful or whatever. Like I was choosing to wake up every day and be stressed. And I did his online intensive and progressive course during COVID. It was a great like, well, like it, I, it empowered me beyond measure. Like I'm in control to a certain degree and actually not in control at all. But like, I get to at least choose how I'm going to flow on this boat ride through life. Am I going to be super stressed or happy? So as soon as one of his week-long events came out through email, I signed up for it right away. And you guys signed up for the same one. So I was super stoked when I was driving up one morning and I saw you and Allison walking up the street. I was like, yo, let's <laughs> go. Uh, Luke and Allison and Marco Island, like this is, it was fire. So anyway, that was an, such a good event that as I mentioned to you, I signed up for the next one. So two months later in the end of February, so that was early January 21 and end of February 21. That one was so good. I signed up for one three months later in the middle of June in 21. That one was so great. I signed up for one in September in 2021 in Turkey. And I was like, because I want to go to Europe and I ended up going. And, and then I signed up for another one in February of 22 and I'm going to another one in June. So it'll be six in a year and a half coming up pretty soon. I'm very stoked. But as you know, because you were there, like he describes very clearly how in, in, in a way that some people would say is woo-woo, but to the open-minded people like us, you can actually say, maybe there's something to this. You dissolve your concept of yourself into the blackness, into the oneness, into the field or God consciousness, the everything all around. And the idea is like, if you could connect to the perfection and unison of everything that's all around us, you could actually heal in an instant by eliminating those disconnects or let's say, delusions that we hold within our limited perception and reuniting with like the all in all, the, the infinite, right? And, and as you're, again, also aware, because you went to the event, like there are people at his events, like throughout the last year and, and the ones I went to earlier this year, people who, and the past ones, who literally have miracle healings, like people who, there was a woman at that event in Marco Island who was par like paralyzed, couldn't walk, and by the end, she was swimming laps in the pool. There was a dude at a later event who was, uh, had chronic pain in his legs. He wanted to have his limbs chopped off. Uh, but they said they couldn't even guarantee the pain would go away because of the phantom pain phenomenon. And so he ended up just going all in on Dr. Joe. And by the end of the week, he went from his wheelchair to two crutches walking on the beach to one crutch. And by the end of the week, he was sprinting down the beach. And Dr. Joe tells the story like a volunteer was running to chase the guy down. Like there are people who restored full vision in you know a healing meditation like where they fully connected let's say to this healing energy field and so all that's to say like that's that's it that's what i was looking for i had my own like let's say moments where i maybe i didn't have like a you know light beaming through my body but i had some pretty intense emotions and feelings where i connected to that that light that some kind of source energy and the only thing that could happen was like tears like streaming down my face and like heart lit up. I mean, everyone's, I think, felt this at one point or another, at least I would hope. 
So to me, I was like, that's what I was looking for all those years. Not the diet, not the health, not the this. I just wanted to feel whole. I wanted to feel loved. And I was thinking, well, Dr. Joe is a genius and extremely intelligent the way he's putting this information out, but he isn't the first person to talk about this. Like for sure, the ancient Indian, Eastern and Chinese and so on masters and the Sufis and many others have been talking about the same thing. So why not like go straight to the source now that I'm sold? So I started reading all these books from Paramahansa Yogananda, the Indian yogi, because I happen to be in Encinitas a lot. And that's where he spent the last you know, 13 years of his life. And so I thought maybe that wasn't a coincidence that I ended up there before knowing anything about him. And then I met a guy surfing in Bali several years ago who was like a actually like part of the lineage. Like his master is one of Yogananda's descendants. His master's based in India. He's one of the leading Kriya yoga masters of the day. And he, he was actually, I, I recall later, like he was the first guy to ever tell me about Dispenza because he was trying to point me in this direction. So all these pieces came together and I just realized like, you know, okay, can I scientifically articulate mechanism for mechanism for mechanism for mechanism, like exactly how it all works, like exactly how when someone goes into a healing moment, like exactly how it happens. Not exactly. Dr. Joe could do a better job, so I recommend people check out his work. But even then, like if a skeptical scientist wanted to go into Dr. Joe and, you know, try to tear it all apart, sure they could. They could, you know, use their lens and see that his stuff doesn't fit in their lens. But that's what we call like the profane, the people who won't believe no matter what. And for me, there's enough pieces that lined up here, especially with the scientific foundation of the body electric to understand that the basis for this, this existence of this energy field around our body, which is more or less connected with all of the energy of the universe as well as we are. Because the, the cool thing, and Dispenza really hammers this in, is we are not the matter that makes up our body. And that was another thing that Dr. Becker made clear in his book, The Body Electric. Like when you have a limb chopped off of a salamander, it regenerates like perfectly the way it was before. So like if that salamander is so connected to its body and that limb comes off, like, and, and the salamander is just its body, how would it know, how do all the cells know to reorganize themselves exactly in the right way? The salamander is not the body. The salamander is the field. And the body is just what Joe Dispenza calls the hologram that we see in the three-dimensional reality in this, in this uh, slice of what we're able to perceive of, of the total reality. And in the same way, like when a human uh, you know, egg cell is fertilized with the sperm, and that genetic information is shared, there's a big blast of light energy and sort of activation of a, of a process that starts occurring, the unfolding of life. It's actually really like an unfolding when a baby is growing. It's like unfolding of information and energy. But how does the, how do the, no, no standard biology can answer this. So any standard biologist who tries to debunk Dispenza, they have to debunk themselves first. Like they, <laughs> seriously, there, there's no standard biology theory that can explain how the toes become the toes, the head becomes the head, the eye tissue becomes the eyes, the liver becomes the liver. Because guess what? Every single liver cell, every single retinal cell, every single brain cell, they all have the same 23 chromosomes with the exact same genes. So how do they know how to be there and there and there and there and this and that and the other thing exactly where they need to be at exactly the right time, exactly always, always exactly? there's no amount of biological uh, orchestration that could make that possible. It's just, it, there's nothing in standard biological theory. But Becker's book is the opening foundation for that. It's energy medicine. It's the camp called the vitalists. The vitalists were people who believed that there was some energy spark responsible for life. And they're competing. And this was like camps of scientists in the 1700s, 1500s, way back. And then their other ones were the mechanists. And they were like, life is not energy-based. It's all about chemicals and blah, blah, blah. And Becker basically exposes like the vitalists kind of lost out with the advent of penicillin and the advent of you know, antibiotics and, and drug-based medicine, which was largely pushed as a side note by John D. Rockefeller paying a guy named Abraham Flexner, who apparently wasn't even a scientist, to write a report called the Flexner Report to Congress, basically shadow banning or canceling, not shadow banning, but openly canceling, quote unquote, in modern lingo, all vitalist-based medicine sources, acupuncture, Reiki, herbs, homeopathy, all of it was considered non-medical in the eyes of the law because of the Flexner report. And the only evidence-based medicine is a drug that you can create as a byproduct of petroleum, which is what all modern pharmaceuticals are, which is John D. Rockefeller's business, hence why he did it. And that you, you could have a problem and input a drug 
and then get a result. And so that's what happened in medicine. But the reason I share all of this is to go back to the, 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 what I see to be tremendous shortcomings of the carnivore diet because it falls prey to the idea that you are not responsible for your healing, but that it's gonna come from something outside of you. And you have to basically be like the person who insulates themselves with bubble wrap and just goes around the world protecting yourself constantly. You can't eat a blueberry, you can't eat a cashew, you can't eat anything because your body and your spirit is too weak to take any of that stuff. Now, this could catch a lot of heat, but I'm happy to share it because it's true. And the, the idea is that people who will truly heal will heal themselves by overcoming whether it's a trauma or an emotional belief or could be excess artificial light tex- toxicity. It could be a lack of sunlight. It also could be a lot of other factors, right? Like it's not just emotions. It's not just, although some like Dispenza would say that's the main factor. And so... All that's to say that I feel very uh, strongly that people should be very careful when they buy into the idea of carnivore diets and these types of things, because again, it's, it's saying that we don't understand how healing actually works and that the best you can do is cut out every possible thing that could possibly activate your body without ever looking inward and actually working on healing yourself from the inside out. And again, oftentimes we can see people who are, who are very, very... Uh, there are very fam- lots of very famous people who have gone carnivore who are very sick and it didn't actually help them. Like, um, I- I'm not sure I should use a name here, but there's a very, very prominent psychologist who's been known to have lots of bouts of health challenges and stuff. And it's like, and off- went fully carnivore and it didn't really heal. It didn't really work. Like, it doesn't work for a lot of people. And if you go on Reddit, you can see a huge amount of carnivore threads, like problems with carnivore. But it's, I don't mean to just single out carnivore. It really goes for any diet, whether it's the autoimmune paleo diet or the paleo diet itself and paleo effects or the GAPS diet. Like they're all, and I can speak from experience because I did basically all of them. It's it's all an attempt to like cover up uh, something that you haven't dealt with yourself, like something that needs to be internally dealt with. And the diets for me were always an excuse from like actually being present in the world. It was like, I need to eat perfectly. I need, and, and people, that's why people are so warlike about their diets. And that's why it's almost crazy I'm saying this, but people identify so much because it's like they build this concept of like, you have to be carnivore. And, and, and someone else who's able to thrive as a vegan threatens their sense of their identity because they're building their identity on a very precarious foundation because it's based on n- nothing, really. Have you ever wondered why some people get really sick while others only have mild cases? Well, researchers say the answer can be found in your gut health. A study published this year suggests that people with leaky gut and other gut symptoms may be at higher risk of severe illness. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, more than 70% of your immunity is created in your gut. Why does this matter, you might ask? Well, even if you're doing everything right, you will still be exposed to viruses and bacteria. It's simply unavoidable. It's just kind of how the world works. Now, personally, I've had a lot of leaky gut issues over the years and have made some huge improvements lately. I recently found an insanely cool product called Biome Breakthrough. Biome Breakthrough is the only formula that can repair compromised gut lining. So it helps to rebuild with the right probiotics and prebiotics and activate the four critical pathways to super immunity. It eliminates bad bacteria, feeds the good bacteria, and gives your immunity the strength it needs to fight off viruses. It's really cool stuff. It also comes in two flavors, chocolate carnivore and vegetarian vanilla. How I use it is I just throw this stuff in whatever morning drink I make, hot or cold, and it tastes delicious or not noticeable in some cases, and also mixes easily with pretty much everything. So power up your immunity today and try Biome Breakthrough risk-free by visiting biomebreakthrough.com slash Luke. And of course, I got a code for you. It's Luke10. That gets you 10% off any order. Again, that code is Luke10, and the website is biomebreakthrough.com slash Luke. And listen, if it doesn't work for you, these guys will give you your money back within 365 days of purchase. Totally risk-free, awesome works. Check it out. There is a lot to unpack in there. (laughs) I think fundamentally, you said at one point of looking for something outside of yourself, to repair and heal right and this is 
I think also, you know, you use carnivore diet as an example or any of these fad diets, but it's also true of all of the biohacking stuff too, right? There's a, there's a fine line between kind of experimentation and optimization and self-discovery and research, but there's also this slippery slope of temptation to get so caught up, and I'm speaking from direct personal experience, so caught up in always thinking you need something from the outside. And if you really look at the core of what most humans are after is just a sense of belonging, fulfillment, purpose, serenity, love, acceptance, connection. And so it's like the end goal is that, right? And we get caught up in all of these kind of touch points along the way to that. But going back to the work in consciousness and Joe Dispenza and these other spiritual teachers you mentioned, it's like all of that kind of shortcuts and supersedes all of these external, more matter, physical-based regimens and practices and things like that. And, and you can see this. I think you meet someone who doesn't pay much attention to how they eat, doesn't take supplements, doesn't do biohacking, but they have a robust spiritual practice and, um, and a sense of faith, right? And, and the inner knowing that they possess the power needed to achieve that end goal. And they're fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, how do, you, how do you explain that? You know, I mean, I see my wife is kind of like that. I mean, she's healthy, but she doesn't do all the stuff that I do. And she's doing great, right? Because she has her spiritual connection and her practices and things like that. So I don't, like for me, it's not, a, it's not a either or. But ultimately, I think if any of us look at why we're doing anything, you exercise, you eat what you think is right at any given time, um, everything that we're motivated by, like the end goal is why we're doing it. So what if we could just jump to the end goal? <laughs> right? Exactly. Right? And then, and I found this to be true lately, like I kind of eat whatever, you know, people are like, what diet do you do? And I go, I don't know. I just, whatever I feel like eating kind of, I mean, I try to avoid seed oils and, you know, obviously pesticides and glyphosate and some of the things that I know would be more difficult to overcome metaphysically because they're just so taxing. Um, but I find like the more I sort of surrender into that universal power of healing and well-being, um, the more sympathetic my body is to me being a little looser about how I live. And there's, there's less of that orthorexic kind of contraction, right? This fear-based contraction of eating the blueberry or the broccoli or whatever it is. I mean, I even eat gluten sometimes and I'm fine. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I react to it, but sometimes I eat it. And then the next day I'm like waiting for inflammation or whatever other symptoms. And I go, I'm fine. You know, it's just like I was in the right state of mind that day. Right. And I was just enjoying my life. I wasn't being so retentive and uptight. And uh, my body responded with the ability to metabolize those things. And on a different day might be problematic. So I love that you're, you know, how old are you now? 22. Yeah. You're so stoked, bro. If I could go back in a time machine and just put your brain in my 22-year-old head, <laughs> I'd have had a much easier time for the 20 <laughs> years after that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is like, this is really the key, you know, as within, so without. And it's like that, the slow process, and maybe you could unpack, actually unpack this since you've spent so much time with Joe Dispenza um, the past couple of years. It's like... <sighs> The speed with which one can affect change working from matter to matter versus energy to matter. Maybe go into that a little bit. Because yeah. I think that's where all of this sort of culminates and, and why this process is perhaps going to help people save a lot of time and money. Yeah, of course. So the matter to matter versus energy to matter. So first, I would just to further explicate the point, I would say that uh, if you had taken my brain and put it in your body 22 years old, based on what I've just shared, the brain wouldn't have done anything because the spirit is what guides the function of everything. So you would need my spirit basically, or my energy field, because if you had taken a brain raw materials, but put it into your body, but still governed by a different energy field, it would have resumed the functions just like an organ transplant does of that other field. <laughs> That's interesting. So yeah. you would actually need my, yeah. my energy field, your consciousness. basically my consciousness, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so to speak, which isn't mine per se. It's the, uh, you know, I'm, working on doing my best to merge it's with the a single point of access of your consciousness yeah, exactly. right? interfacing with the field the whole the totality <laughs> great, of consciousness great way to put it. so yeah. that's one so thing. if i could have taken your single point of consciousness <laughs> access 
and neuralinked it into my 22-year-old dumbass self, I would have had a much easier time. <laughs> You're hilarious. So, um, and then one other thing I would just point out is you mentioned like it's not either or. Like it, it isn't either or. Like I'm not saying people should, you know, meditate and take care of their spirit and and eat like junk. Like why? that doesn't make sense, right? That's not intelligent. That just isn't a, a sensible practice. Uh, however, as the acute listener would recall from earlier, the question that I really had all this time, I didn't even know I had the question, but it, it showed itself as I started to learn this stuff was that, you know, how does the autoimmune paleo protocol actually lead to healing? Like, what is that force that's leading to healing? And as you said, you, you can connect to that, that greater consciousness that can heal. And the more that you do, you, you know, maybe things become easier for you. I have come to believe that that is the only force that heals. That is the only thing that's responsible for healing. Even when we go in the sun, we're sort of using the sun as a channel to connect to that greater energy or red light therapy. Like these are more energetic forms. But for example, if you were really, let's say sick in your spirit, you could take in all the sun. And this was my exact experience. I took in so much sun and red light therapy and, and blocked all the blue light just as, as Dr. Cruz advised. And I was still struggling. I was like, this can't be it. And I would be excited to share with people like just when I was on paleo, like this is the thing, you gotta do this. Just like someone who's on carnivore, like this is the thing. Uh, you know, and then when I was on the light, the just the light protocols, the quantum health stuff, I was like, this is the thing, everyone has to do this. But like proselytizing almost out of a place of not being secure in myself. And that's to say that, Yes, we can do like the light therapy and take the supplements and eat the healthy diet and eat all this stuff. But all of my experience at least showed me that the thing that, that really is responsible for the healing is that connection and that any level of the orthorexia that goes into, as you mentioned, of any of this stuff is actually directly like limiting our access. And so as you said, like you could just jump into the states of bliss and joy and that that is like the challenge. Like, can you, and uh, Michael A. Singer in The Untethered Soul does a really great job of, of sharing this idea. Like, Incredible book. You, yeah, incredible. I, I re-listen to it frequently on audio, like anytime I walk, because it just brings me to a state that I can't really describe in any other words other than you have to read it and experience it and surrender into it. But he explains like, you don't have to be unhappy. Like we can just choose to be ridiculously happy and in any situation and keep that, and the only reason we lose that is because there's something we're willing to trade our happiness for. So if I, if I decided just right now to be like extremely happy, like maybe, who knows, what would I be letting go of my happiness for? Maybe it's because I feel like if I just get too happy, like someone's going to judge me or it's going to like make the podcast weird or I'm going to go into a, like a state of, for example. Please don't be too happy on this podcast. Yeah, all right? Right? We like to keep it somber. <laughs> like, you know, but there's this sort of like, maybe lack of worthiness. Like maybe there's just a discomfort that you get to a certain place and you're just like, no, like I can't, I can't, I can't just be happy. Like beyond that point, like there's just some, there's some blockages that have we have. Have you hit. read The Big Leap by no. Gay Hendricks? No. Uh, bro, you got to read that. Big Leap, like, right. Yeah. He, he eliminates this, um, this idea called the upper limit where each of us has this kind of self in, imposed. Self, yeah, self-imposed. There's the word I'm looking for. Um, real coffee deficiency. This, <laughs> this, this self-imposed upper limit of joy, fulfillment, happiness. And, and what's even more interesting about the way he frames it, and there's a lot more to it, but the part that I think I really identified with and have taken as a, as a tool is that when we hit a certain point, it's not only that there's a part of us that doesn't believe that we can achieve greater states of well-being and happiness and just be free, which is what I hear you describing, but that will subconsciously sabotage ourselves and even get physically ill. And there's this phenomenon of people like getting a promotion or you're going to do a keynote speech or it's your wedding day, like a, a huge leap forward in terms of your quality of life and your body, your subconscious will make your body sick in an effort to keep you at that level at which it was comfortable because you're about to surpass your upper limit and your capacity for, for joy and success in, in every element of your life. I mean, that, that book and that particular teaching in that book is huge because I, I see it within myself still, you know, it's like, I just bought this house and spent a hellish 15 months renovating it. And it's like, I see there's a point at which it's like, oh, I, you know, we can't get it done. It's just, it would be too good for me. You know, it's like a sense of not deserving it almost. And then perpetuating delays and problems. Not that it was all my fault, but there were points at which I was like, oh, I'm making this harder 
because there's a part of me that's like not ready to just go big and like have a family and be married and adult, right? And so mm-hmm. it's like, ah, oh, there's these blocks put in place that make it more difficult. And there's kind of a constriction in that and, and more friction and more challenges and problems. And not all of it, but part of that could be attributed to that upper limit. But there's a part of me that's just like, ah, I can't imagine myself existing on the 21st floor. So I'm just going to hang out at the 15th floor and frustrate myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, all you can really do is break through to the 16th and go, okay, can I go further? Can I go further? And, and give oneself permission. As you said, I don't want to be too happy on this podcast. You know, it's a great, I experience that all the time when I'm really in my power and in my truth. I notice that there's a part of me that wants to kind of downplay it and play small because I don't want to shine and make someone uncomfortable or, you know, bring undue attention to myself or cause people to be envious or jealous or something like that because I'm killing it. I experienced that a lot during the COVID era uh, because I, at many points, I mean, as concerned as I was about some of the social implications of this whole disaster, I was living my best life. I like staying home. You know what I mean? And I was still, you know, making a living and doing great. I did better in the past couple of years financially than I've ever done, for example. And then, I, you know, I feel bad for the people that have lost their livelihoods and stuff. But it's like to, to um, hold back from celebrating that and acknowledging that with, with humility, hopefully, you know, with gratitude and an, an earnest kind of um, honoring that you were only a participant in your success but that need that some of us have to stay small is so perfectly illustrated by that concept of the upper limit. The upper it's like, limit. what if we just were conscious of that and just ignored that and just went for broke, you know? There's a really cool poem. Uh, I forget the name and the author, so it's not going to be of much else, but people will recognize it. It's like, you know, the woman starts this poem as saying, like, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. It's that we are powerful beyond measure. Um, and you could probably yeah. find this, Bailey. It's, it's really, really good. Um, if, you, if you get it, you can just share the name, and we might even want to throw it in the show notes. But it is a really powerful, and it's like, it showed me, like, wait, that's the fear. It's not that I'm, it's that somehow I would, like, shine so much and then make people around me uncomfortable. But, like, that, that's, that's the whole message and so now like the the message with Ra, like our logo what we're putting on the inside of our glasses case now is you are the light of the world because even jesus said in a bible verse and we'll get to jesus <laughs> soon enough but um he said that you know you are the light of the world um you know a house that's built on a hill cannot be hidden for long and something like that and i'm loosely paraphrasing but basically so and you too you know should let your light shine so that you know men can see your works, men and women can see your works and that your father in heaven can see your works too. And it's like, that to me is like the calling. It's like, why don't we just shine? Like, why don't we just, and that's why we get on this podcast. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be shy and not tell the truth to people. Cause like I happen to have gone through a tremendous amount of pain and suffering. I mean, really for uh, someone who was 18, 17 years old, I suffered a lot. Thankfully I wasn't like, uh, I, I, and also I want to be careful, like, cause there's an addiction to reliving that and going back by talking about it. And it's like, no, 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 not necessary, not even useful. But th- th- I'm, I'm fortunate because I had such great, uh, opportunities, like so much, uh, you know, growing up in a fairly wealthy area and going to a high school where public high school, where every single student got a MacBook air given to them by the school district to use like super bougie, like, uh, you know, <laughs> Like all these opportunities, a business making money coming in every month where I can go travel and do whatever I want. And yet I was still stuck, like feeling tremendously stuck, stressed, in pain, suffering, miserable. And, you know, I mentioned that I learned from Dispenza, like that was my sort of my fault, but I didn't know that at the time or my choice, let's say, to stay there. And, and I, yeah, I was so like, on the, you know, let's say the, the, the fifth floor that I didn't want to go up higher, I didn't even realize, I didn't really take the time after a certain point to dream that I could go higher. So when I started listening to Dispenza's work, I realized like, you know, I've heard people say like happiness is like a muscle. Like if you don't use it, it atrophies. It's not like you can store happiness for the future. So I bought into this very American and Western idea that I could like save my happy, happiness for the future. So when I was a kid, I was in high school, like I start, I was having fun, hanging out. But after a certain point, when I, I went abroad, um, my junior year of high school, when I was 16 to live in Bosnia and Eastern Europe, we talked about that on the first podcast, I believe. 
And I, at around then, but even earlier when I started to take care of my health, like I went from being like more of a happy-go-lucky, like young guy who's running track and field, having fun with my buddies, you know, doing stupid stuff, but like having a good time to like, fully embracing this idea that like I need to work super hard to secure safety and stability for myself in order to be okay. And that the key word there is that in order to be okay, like I couldn't be okay, period. I had to do all this stuff to be okay. And that actually that one sentence and the changing of the words there to have to do all these things to be good or okay, versus just being able to be okay. That was how I spent from age about 14, 13, 14 until last year, 21, so seven years. So all of my memorable life, I spent in a state of thinking besides, you know, the the fleeting memories from below the age of 13, but majority of my conscious memorable life, uh, age 14 to 21, I was in this idea, this delusion that I couldn't be okay as me and just who I am, where I am in any moment that I had to be constantly doing something or striving for something. And it came out in many different forms. You know, one particular line I remember was when I would tell my mom that I was, I always felt like I was doing the wrong thing. Like no matter how hard I was working, no matter how good the business was going, no matter how much this, this was when I was like 18, 19, early in the business. And I just remember telling her like, I always felt like I wasn't doing the right thing. No matter what I did, I didn't feel like it was the right thing. And I remember her saying to me, just like, you know, in a motherly way that only a mother can, like, honey, like that sounds really tough, like to not, feel like you're doing the right thing ever. Like that's got to be a pretty challenging way to live your life. Like that wouldn't be fun. And, and yet that was just like, for whatever reason, I embodied that delusion. Like it was the truth, you know, like I, and, and you can see by having like a, you know, multi-million dollar business 22, because I embodied that delusion. And I'm not saying that having a, a multi-million dollar company at my age is bad, but the amount of forcing, pushing and stressing that I've put myself through to do that was not like necessarily something that was good. I feel that people are prone to go into this delusion just because like it's what we're taught and that like many people don't like there, there's a great book called The Catcher in the Rye that I read in, in a literature class in high school that talks about how like the catcher in the rye was like the, the person, the child who saved people from like falling into like the, the delusion of adulthood, you know? And, and I just funny that this just, just came up because I haven't thought of this book in literally five years or six years since high school. But, um, and I was like, how, you know, it'd be nice to not fall into the trappings of, the, of adulthood. And yet I did. And then uh, many people, I think they like stay in like the Peter Pan, like the childhood, like they don't want to become an adult, but they think mistakenly that being an adult has to be like miserable and stressful like that by taking on that responsibility like you have to become like less happy and that almost at least I can only speak for myself but there's a belief that I actually had to be stressed or unhappy maybe that was the example I had for my parents or people I saw around me like that in order to be like acceptable as a person, I had to be experiencing and ex- accepting some level of stress. And so I just took that to the fullest extent possible. I accepted as much stress as I could, so to speak, in an energetic level. I like chose to always be stressed, thinking that by always being stressed, I was like worthy. Like I was worthy of of something good because I was choosing to always be stressed. And that's why I love learning. You know, I wasn't raised Christian at all, but I love the Bible because Jesus teaches like, that's just not how it is. Like you just, you're worthy because you are. And like, you can just be love. And that's like, that's worthiness. And so by, by being stressed and forcing and forcing and forcing, um, yes, it led me to have a business, uh, but it wasn't fulfilling. It didn't, it didn't lead me anywhere that I wanted to go. And, and so seven years later, you know, I finally realized like, why do people think that back to this idea of like delaying my happiness for the future and the happiness being muscle, like, why does anybody think that you can save happiness for later? So I thought like, okay, like I'm going to put my head down, spend all my, like my high, my high school years focusing on healing my health. And then, okay, now I need to focus on starting a business so I can be financially secure. And then I can focus on uh, building the business so that I can be financially stable. Like, and all of these things in my mind were like 
I need to do these in order to be okay. And so I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing with that energy. And I remember one time a friend of mine, uh, Mike Russo, who you know, he would tell me like, you know, like the best thing that could happen to you at one point. And he was like my biggest fan, like biggest supporter. He came in to help me grow my business. And at one point he actually said to me, like the best thing that could happen for you would be if your business actually like went away, like failed. And, and it was such a hard thing to swallow, but I understand now and the level of love and like care that he has in saying that was beyond massive because I was doing what people are doing, whether it's with the carnivore diet or whether it's with other things. I was doing everything possible to create that insulation, that bubble wrap around myself so that I never had to go anywhere that was uncomfortable. I was fully insulating myself from ever having to feel like those feelings of whatever it was, some trauma or something that maybe happened when I was a young kid not necessarily worth going there, but something was there. And finally, it was just like, maybe I can just let all this go. And like, it'd be like if you spent really like so many years building up like a persona and like becoming someone to, and then finally just being like, like I have to let it all go. And that's sort of what I've been starting to go through. And if it meant like that the business goes away, and that was like the hardest thing because I was so attached, like I need the financial income to maintain my freedom and blah, blah, blah. As if I needed it, which isn't even true. And there's something to be said about just not buying into that mindset that like you have to suffer in order to be successful. Because as the masters teach, like every moment that you're not happy, it's just a lost moment. That's it. You're never going to get that moment back. And so it's like, why couldn't I just cultivate like true blissful happiness in every moment, regardless of the situation and see the beauty in like sitting across from this beautiful soul here doing a podcast, like blessed with everything and, and be in that energy all the time. And then letting, they say like, you have to let the other stuff that comes up, like fall to the wayside. It's, uh, so prevalent in, in you know, in humanity's experience in general, but specifically, I think, in the realm of business and entrepreneurship and any type of high performance. I mean, it could be said of an athlete or anyone that's trying to achieve a state of greatness and success is this thing that we catch, this this sort of mental meme, this erroneous mental meme that our worth and our value as a person is based on what we do rather than who we are. And I've seen this in relationship with other people, um, in romantic relationships where, you know, I'm just trying to enjoy that person for who they are. Like my wife, Allison, for example, being one of them, you know, and um, as someone who is really productive and built this career and is an author and doing all these amazing things, like that's not why I love that person and love their company and love spending time with them. It's, it's like the core of who they are. I just want to be in the essence of their spirit and their soul and the way that that animates their personality. What they do is like, doesn't mean anything to me. I totally don't care what someone does. It's who you are, right? And it's, I think, easier to apply that to people outside of oneself. But when, because I relate to everything you're saying as a, you know, um, entrepreneur myself for a long time. It's how do we get to the point where we're able to really love and accept ourselves for who we are and acknowledge that it's difficult to be self-referential in that way, to look in the mirror and go, who you are is perfect and awesome. You know, we want to see the metric of, of who we are, which is the manifestation, the material results of who we are. I did this. I built that. I achieved that. I got the accolades. I got the awards. I got the social media following, the website clicks, whatever it is that you're measuring who you are by is the result. But what if we could just be with who we are, is what I'm hearing you say, and actually celebrate more in that. And the byproduct of that is likely the same success that we were trying to achieve by measuring our success by what we achieved, right? It's like, when I'm with you, I don't, I'm not like, oh, Matt's so cool. He has this company. Like, I don't care about your company. I don't think about your company. I just like your energy. You text us. Hey, you guys want $27 smoothies from Sun Life? I got you. Show up with the... <laughs> Bomb smoothie, super happy, great hug, <laughs> authenticity, big heart, super smart, you know, like your wisdom, just who you are as a energetic being is why I love and respect you. I, it doesn't matter what you do, you know what I mean? And that's so easy for me to see sitting at you because you're not me. But how do I wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and go, you're fucking awesome, kid. 
you know, regardless of how much I accomplished or didn't accomplish. Because mm-hmm. I have that same thing. Like it's very easy. I've been meditating for 25 years, you know, uh, pretty much daily. The past 20, I would say, um, rarely a day goes by that I don't get at least one meditation. And so I'm someone who's practiced in the art of being present, yet at times it's difficult to take that man, that that meditation into a state of being and activity, right? It's like, can I just sit at home and just do nothing? No, sometimes because I feel like I should be accomplishing something. I should be producing something. Because I still have that belief, you know, on occasion. I mean, it's, I would say, becoming less so over time because of conversations like this and applying some of the things I'm learning. But what if one could just be in their own presence and not base their worth or value on what's being produced or what's being accomplished. And, and my theory on this, based on experience, is sometimes you actually accomplish more because there's not that sense of pushing and resistance, right? You're not swimming upstream. You're kind of in that energetic flow and then you find yourself doing things without so much attachment to the outcome. It's just doing something, any kind of activity or any sort of production because you just enjoy being with yourself in the act of producing and creating. It's just, it's that present moment awareness combined with action rather than action to hope that we achieve some sense of peace and present moment awareness when all the work's done. You know, it's Mm -hmm. that like uh, Western model of work your ass off until you're 65, then retire, you know? And I think what's interesting about the lifestyle you're creating and the inner work that you're doing is what if rather than going on a permanent vacation at 65, what if there were momentary vacations within along the way of just enjoying one's own vitality and one's own energy and just being with that. Yeah. But in order to do that, I think in my experience, there's a lot of clearing and a lot of shadow work that's been necessary. Because oftentimes, and I want to get your take on this, I think oftentimes what drives us is we're actually running from something that we don't want to face. There, there are hurts in our heart that haven't been healed. There are ways in which we've trained ourselves to think. There are hidden traumas, um, personality flaws, defects, negative patterns of thinking, feeling, behaving that we're running away from, right? And there's, it's like the hellhound on my trail. You know, it's a famous blues song, or probably many of them with the same theme, right? It's like we're constantly like, oh, the boogeyman's about to get me. What if we were able to just, you know, through different practices, turn around and face the boogeyman and really get into the depth of what has caused our suffering and really be with that as uncomfortable and terrifying and painful as it is so that one can gain the ability to just sit and be with ourselves. Out of all of the incredible healing tools and gadgets I have around the house, there aren't many that I use every day. One brand that consistently makes it into my routine is Higher Dose. I usually start my day on their large infrared PEMF mat, which combines the powerful technology of infrared heat with PEMF for an incredible recharging experience. PEMF, if you don't know, stands for Pulsed Electromagnetic Field, and it works by sending electromagnetic waves through your body at different frequencies to help your body's own recovery process. It's uh, relaxing while energizing at the same time, which is incredible. So I use the smaller mat here in the studio since it fits comfortably in an office chair or on the sofa and the regular size mat for meditating or napping. You can also do yoga on the big one if you were so inclined. And I'm also a longtime infrared sauna user, but they can be both bulky and expensive. So if you don't have the budget or the room for a full-size sauna, the Higher Dose Sauna Blanket is a game changer. It's portable and super easy to use and store when you're not using it. You just turn it on, put on some cotton clothing, wrap yourself up like a burrito, and sweat like crazy. The sauna blanket's got an amethyst layer to deepen the benefits of infrared, a tourmaline layer that generates negative ions, a charcoal layer to bind any pollutants that come out of your body, and a clay layer which is balancing for the heat. So this is really cool stuff, and you can snatch yourself your very own infrared sauna blanket or PEMF mat at higherdose.com today. And if you use my exclusive promo code LUKE15 at checkout, you'll save 15% off. That's higherdose.com, D-O-S-E. And the promo code again is LUKE15. I've been into 
to energetic healing technologies for many years, especially those that are supported for EMF exposure. And there are a lot of so-called quantum products on the market, and I've tried just about any one I've ever heard of, but few of them have had any noticeable effect. However, there is one product line that's passed my test and become part of my arsenal, and it's called Leela Quantum Tech. Leela Quantum has developed a groundbreaking technology to increase your energy level, become more stress resistant, and also helps to support your whole family, pets, and garden with pure quantum energy. The Leela Quantum products have been certified and studied by various third-party institutes and doctors, and these studies have proved and these studies have found significant improvements in people's blood, cellular voltage, allergy reduction, and heart rate variability. But my favorite benefit of all is that the Leela Quantum products help neutralize harmful frequencies, including any EMF like 4G, 5G, microwaves, and Wi-Fi. In fact, I have the Leela Quantum block in my kitchen where I charge my food, drinks, and supplements, as well as the Infinity block in my living room and here in the studio for a huge energetic upgrade. Leela Quantum Tech is a truly conscious business that wants to do good in the world and even plants a tree for every order. So if you want to get on board, you can get 10% off your first order by visiting leelaq.com and using the discount code 10 Luke. That's L-E-E-L-A-Q.com. And the new customer discount code is 10 Luke. When I sit and meditate in the morning, if I really go all in and I really put in a proper effort to overcome myself and to be willing to break through that uh what was the term of the sort of ceiling the, we the, create? the upper limit the upper limit so to actually break through some kind of upper limit and i'll spend days sometimes weeks working like eight hour days six hour days or longer sometimes whatever i try not to work too much you know there's this thing like that you're cool if you work 20 hour days like i don't think that's cool like i think that's misery and i wouldn't wish that upon anyone i think it's cool to be able to work four hours or six hours in a day or less and be having a successful company that's a measure of success for me not someone who says and to I not work. feel guilty about it right? yeah and to feel like <laughs> i'm hey i'm proud that i i've been able to be efficient like i always i think what i've seen and i've a- a- emulated for long enough to realize that it's not the way is the people who say i work 16 hour days and feeling like i had to work 16 hour days or even 10 hour days whatever to be worthy or even eight hour days and that if I could actually run my business and work three hours a day and do something really valuable and enjoy the rest of my life and be able to concentrate some of the great energy for my enjoyment into moving the business forward the next day that I think that that's cooler and more respectable than someone who's like choosing. It's like our culture rewards the victims. It's like, it's like we put uh, in many, many levels, which we could, we will not get into probably now, but like the victims are rewarded in every area and it's so much so that the guy who's like yeah i worked 80 hours a week like that that's the one who's rewarded it's like don't you don't have to work that long to be successful and we this is we'll go all the way back to your original question eventually and, and touch on that <laughs> but so that i would actually we get, into the, we get into the answer for the first question at 90 minutes yeah, exactly. at the 90 minute mark. <laughs> yeah so i um i've had so many times where like i would have one great meditation and in that one great meditation whether it was 30 minutes an hour two hours where i like fully overcame something that I had been ignoring for months, maybe years, maybe I didn't even know was there. And it felt like more productive work was done in that period than the next uh, or the previous two months combined. And and as a matter of fact, like there can be specific problems in my business that I've spent so much energy to try to address in the, to the question we didn't answer, the matter to matter way of solving problems. So you asked the question and we can touch on this one of how touching a solution from energy versus matter can be effective. So for example, I'll give a very real uh, moment example. So for example, I'm ordering things from China, like glasses cases for our glasses. And they're a, a important part of the product, but they're not essential, but they are sort of really important for the presentation. I want to have like our logo on the cases. I don't want to have to use some generic cases that I could get faster because they're already in the States. I want the ones with our branding. And so I have to order ahead and do a lot of stuff and planning. But anyway, uh, I'd spend a ton of energy actually recently just deciding like, do I want a certain amount to, you know, do I want to have these all sent by sea freight? No, because that's going to take too long, but we might run out of what we have now before that comes in. And there's all these things like that. And 
COVID, who knows? Everything could take way longer. Like when they say a month, it can take three months, it can take four months, it could get stuck in the port and customs and it could be forever. And it could be six months, who knows? Uh, or I could have these things shipped by air freight, but it just costs like three times more. It's way more expensive. And uh, I didn't plan ahead enough to have enough time to get it all by sea. So, so I spent a lot of energy the, just the last few days in this particular instance, thinking about this one very, very minor question in the grand scheme of things, but I'd get so absorbed into it, in, into it in my world of the things I'm doing in my business on a daily basis. And in that is an example to your previous point of a upper limit I've created that like, I should be dealing with these kinds of problems because I believe that like I'm that like a it's my responsibility to deal with those and that b like I'm not worthy of being at a higher plane so to speak and either having someone else deal with that or just say you know what because it is what it is and I could have been planning more ahead but I didn't I'm just gonna have them all come by air freight I'm gonna pay an extra three grand or whatever it's gonna be and then they're gonna come but the thing is if I try to solve it matter to matter in my experience thinking thinking boom boom boom. I'm only going to continue to analyze the situation from a level of mind of scarcity, lack, like constantly with an undertone of guilting myself for not having been more proactive previously. So it's like there's that all that emotions there. And then like I've literally I spent like two or three days like with that as a large subconscious weight that I just didn't solve the past few days. And then like in a moment where, for example, now we're doing a podcast, I'm like, wait, this is my purpose. Like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, teaching and sharing the message. And I know that, but like, I choose to not allow myself that on a daily basis for whatever reason, it's the upper limit. Like letting myself be the guy, let's say, and do my thing and know that I can hire people to support me now that I've gotten to that place that I wasn't at when I've previously tried to make that work. And basically in one period of meditation, or a greater level of thinking, I can arrive, and this is just one instance, but like I could arrive at a higher consciousness and just say, wait, 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 why was I thinking about it like that? Like, okay, yeah, sure, two or three grand, that's not nothing, that's a lot of money. But like in a business standpoint, and I've spent more money than that before, or wasted more money than that before on stupid stuff that, or accidents or mistakes or whatever, like things that you just can't plan for. It's like, it's a, it's a worthwhile thing to solve the problem, get it off my plate and move on to the next thing and not waste days or weeks extending out that phase of unworthiness. Eventually, I'm going to get from A to Z and say, I need to make a decision. Um, so it's just like I'm learning that it's, it, in a way I'm answering the question here. It's like just by connecting to a higher consciousness, a greater, as we said, the singular a, a connection to the greater consciousness, just by instead of trying to solve the problem with the logical awareness of what we have around us, or like what Dispenza would call a more matter to matter approach, just by connecting to, let's say, the consciousness of God, or what we would call a higher consciousness or of the universe, these much clearer perspectives come in, but you have to give them time, like, right, we have to sit disassociate from like, I couldn't sit and think about the problem for an hour because then I've just spent an hour thinking about the problem more. I'd have to actually be willing to get over that. What seems to me often to be like an impossible thing to get over of just like, I'm not going to keep thinking about this. Even if it literally hurts, like it can, like I'll feel it like a weight in my body. I'm not going to think about it. And then, or some people, it might just happen that they just forget about it and they go out for a drive or a walk or a run, and then it just so, sort of solves itself. But again, if you go out for that drive or the walk or the run, and you say that you're going to spend the whole time with it on your mind, you're still not going to solve this. You'd actually have to be, whether it's in a meditation or something else you do, like willing to overcome the, what I would, and Dispenza would say, like, the addiction to the emotion, which in my case, it would be like scarcity, lack, like we can't just spend all that extra money to just solve a problem quickly and move on to much bigger and better things. But like, that's really the only emotion that needs to be overcome. Because if I wasn't in scarcity and lack, I'd say, you know what, we got to do this. I'm going to plan better in the next time so I can get everything in time with sea shipping, even though it takes three times longer or more and just move on and then go and sell, you know, and not just sell, but help a thousand more people in the time I just wasted two days when I could have been recording podcasts and writing content, writing blogs, and go help a thousand more people sell a bunch of glasses, make up for it tenfold, and then we move on and life's better. So it's like in that one instance, I think it beautifully demonstrates like an example of the upper limit way of thinking. Like I'm stuck. There's no solution. This seems so complicated versus like mm. just like burst through. Uh, and then as far as like physical healing, I mean, that maybe goes a little bit deeper, but when people, as, as again, as Dispenza describes, and I'll just make a caveat here. I don't uh, 
claim to perfectly represent the teachings of Dr. Dispenza. I've experienced and learned a lot from him and I'm just doing my best to paraphrase, but if people want that, they should go check him out for sure, drjodispenza.com. Uh, I don't claim to accurately, perfectly represent everything because um, you know he, he asks that people don't try to teach his work. So I'm just sharing from my own personal experience as a journalist might. And so people at these events and in their own meditations, not just at the events, but they will connect somehow, quote unquote, like they describe it as if like their whole body was flooded with light. And so where does that light come from? Well, it's like, it's actually all around us. Like it's that cosmic energy that some people call God, some people call it, well, they call it prana or chi or, you know, life force energy. And it's actually like all around us is the idea, even according to the ancient traditions. And so if someone were able to disassociate from their, their consciousness, so we're not talking about the biology and the cells, like someone's consciousness, which is when I close my eyes, like I have me and my consciousness, that's it. You know, it's not my name, it's not my background, it's not my connections, it's not my history. It is all that we are is that point of consciousness as Michael Singer describes in The Untethered Soul where that consciousness, the, the witness, you know, as he says. And so that witness you know, he says, if you start to meditate on the witness, you'll uncover one of the great mysteries of existence, which as I, so far as I can tell is that that witness is omnipresent, omnipotent. It is sort of like our connection to the all in all. And if someone were to be willing to fully like let go of all of what Sadhguru uh, aptly describes limited identification in a podcast he did with Aubrey Marcus, it's like, we fall prey to limited identification thing. I am Matt or I am Luke or I have this problem or I have to be worrying about this thing. It's like all limited. Like I'm defining myself as this, this guy. If we don't fall prey, like if we can step out of that limited identification, then we can see more of the truth that we are we have access to that energy field that's all around us and that we can actually tune into it. But we'd, we'd have to be literally, as Dispenza says, and other great masters have said, we'd have to be willing to let every single part of ourself that isn't love actually die in order to let the love flow through. So to put this another way for someone to understand it is like people, I've heard people say also really in a cool way that God actually wants to love us. You know, like that is what the Christian scriptures say. And that's what a lot of other people in any spiritual realm will say. God, the, the force, the universe wants to love into us fully. It's just us that stop him or it from fully breathing through us and, and, and lighting us up with that light. So the idea is that maybe another way of putting it is that like we actually already are whole and it's actually the energy. You don't have to go out to get it. It's actually trying to permeate your cells and your being and your chakra system and your whole energy system. And that it is, it is actually our very beliefs and limited identifications about who we are or what we have going on or stored energy in the form of traumas, which represent as constant psycho-emotional baggage that we're carrying around because we haven't solved and worked out those traumas. And it is those very, let's call them kinks. I like to think of it like the spine is a straight line of a soul, let's say, of our energy field and in a way it actually is. And that we actually develop these kinks. So the energy can't flow through. So we actually have to be willing to let go of the kinks, which we're attaching to, as we've described, because of some, they're like our, they make us feel comfortable and safe, right? And we have to be willing to let go of those. And then once we do, as hard as it is, and this is like a work of the heart, like it's not something you can do with your brain, right? Like it's a totally different way of living that I'm starting to just experience a little myself and learn about. But when we can do that work, like the work of the heart, the work of like the, the true light warrior, someone might call them, we could have moments where so much energy is released or like a kink is actually undone in that soul in that spinal energy column. It's just a way of thinking about it. I don't know if it's exactly accurate. And then that energy can flow in and permeate uh, that particular area with this higher consciousness or what we have referred to thus far as that 21st floor of the building when you're hanging out on the fifth floor and you're like literally in a new world. And so in, in many cases, like these people have this experience and they felt so amazing and then their disease went away. And so the way Dispenza has explained it is that it's not that like their disease was healed. It's that 
the foundational issue in their energy field, this kink in their soul, so to speak, was released. And the disease healed because the disease was just the symptom. And so it goes all the way back full circle to the beginning in the same way that like the carnivore diet, just like Western medical drugs, addresses symptoms only, only symptoms. Yes, in a way, it, by removing certain foods and things, it, it, it gives the opportunity like of the body of this energy flow to sort of maybe heal without being berated by these, let's call them plant toxins. But if as soon as the plant toxins go back in, the body reacts like crazy, that fundamental true illness hasn't been healed. So it's like the energy field heals, the disease, which is the symptom of the energy dis imbalance heals, and then the person heals. And that can only be accomplished back to this question of from matter to matter versus energy to matter. You couldn't like logically think yourself, you couldn't therapist yourself to that healing. You couldn't you know, psychologically analyze and move yourself to that healing. Like you'd have to go deep in, in ways that I can't even articulate and let go of the person, as Dispenza says, who is the one who is sick. And you'd have to be willing, like Jesus says, to die, to be reborn. I believe that's something from the, the gospels. So energy to matter seems to be a much more expeditious and effective strategy because if you want something, it means that you can have whatever you want because you already have it. You just have to realize you have it because you don't want the car. You just want to feel like you have the car, the feeling of worthiness, right? Like you don't, want, you don't want all this stuff. And so that's why I said I could literally do two months of work and feel like I did more work in one hour meditation. And, it, and it's actually true because all I was trying to do for those two months of working and grinding, for example, two months, whatever the time period is, was to get to a place where I just felt good. And then in one hour meditation, I just feel good. It's like, I didn't have to do any of that stuff. But then imagine how much better I could actually serve my purpose as a business owner coming from a place of true abundance as opposed to a place of scarcity and lack. And people can feel it. You can feel who's a charlatan and who's not. You know, you can feel it. There's a really great story and I'll sort of uh, wrap this, this spiel up and then maybe we can touch a little bit on the how to run a business while you're on the road part before we wrap up here. But there's a really great story I was told by a good friend of mine who's a practicing yogi. I mentioned I met surfing in the water in Bali and a very prominent Ayurvedic doctor out of Russia. He works with a lot of the top politicians and leaders in Russia and people and you know, hoping that he's getting closer to the big boss um, <laughs> to, to alleviate some of the challenges over there. But basically, he told this beautiful story about, I believe it was Gandhi, when Gandhi was like seeing patients or seeing people. I, and this woman brought her son who had serious issues with sugar consumption. Like she told him the story like, yes, my son has a serious issue with sugar consumption. You know, he's uh, something like he's, you know, looking that it, he's going to have diabetes. It's looking like that. And he, it's just not good. And it's, it's a real big problem. And I, maybe can you help him? And so he says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, so uh, come back in one week and please bring your son. And that's it. And so the woman leaves and then she comes back in a week to see Gandhi and she brings her son. And then he says, is it okay if I speak with your son, you know, alone? And so he speaks with her son and then the son comes out and his sugar issue is completely solved. And so the question is then what did Gandhi do? What did he say to the son? And what he did was he took it upon himself for that week to fast entirely from all sugar, you know, to, to be the living example so that when he would speak the words of why it's important to show that restraint to this, the kid, he's not speaking as a charlatan or someone who just says that they know what they know. He actually did it for a week. That's why he told the woman to come back a week later. And then the boy's problems were solved. So somehow there was a healing that occurred in him because he had maybe the greater consciousness, the greater discipline to accumulate that power within himself. And he was able verbally and energetically to transmit that energy into that child's field, as we're describing, all we are is actually a field. We're not the body. We are the field, as, as I touched on earlier from Becker's work. So his field was able to impart onto that boy's field the truth, and then the boy was healed. And so to me, that's a really beautiful example of how like, I could be like telling all the best words and saying all the best things, but like, if I was in the state I was in like two years ago, super stressed, and coming on like, I know this, I know that about light, I know this, I know that, but not willing to like meaningfully go in, feel something, overcome it, and be maybe slightly wiser from it. I, I wouldn't feel uh, good, first of all, like telling people about 
wellness and happiness and health. And B, it wouldn't even work at a fundamental level because the, the akin and tuned person can smell the charlatan. Before we get into uh, what I'd like to wrap up with just some of the nuts and bolts of the original question, because it's, I think, very useful to people uh, today that have been you know put out of work and are having to reinvent themselves professionally and such. But uh, one thing you touched on that I think is really important, and it's around kind of the upper limit thing, and that is it's the addiction to suffering, you know, in the form of being addicted to addicted to stress, addicted to resentment, addicted to anxiety, addicted to depression. And it's so strange to kind of frame it that way because who would choose that? So why would we become addicted to something that's not preferential, right? And I think that it's about familiarity. You know, when we're in a state or even manifesting circumstances in our life that bring about something that we don't actually enjoy or want or like, yet we're stuck in these patterns of of bringing that back into our experience because it's familiar. And the unfamiliar is that upper limit, right? It's like what you're describing of, well, like, what if I work three or four hours a day and the same amount of stuff gets done and I'm actually happy and enjoying my time with people and things like that. But that's unfamiliar. You know, it's like the uncharted territory. So I think human beings are kind of wired toward familiarity because we perceive that to be where the safety is. And and perhaps it's in there is where that, you know, just to use a generic term of addiction, right? It's like this attachment to just the way things are, not because they're right, but because that's how we know them to be. I think this is really, really important. It's something that's been really valuable to me, especially in the past year, because I've been under... I, I don't know. You always think like the last year was the hardest year, but it's the hardest one in a while, just in terms of the amount of inputs and what's been required of me to manage and, and get done, you know? Um, but I also know that there have been times where I've added things to my plate unconsciously just to make things more stressful because there's a certain familiarity and like having zero time, like one more text, you're like, ah, one more beep on the phone. It just like, it takes me over the edge, you know? And it's like, yeah, but I kind of did it to myself. Why? Right. I could have made things more simplified. I could have taken on less, but it's like that, that drive to achieve and the unconscious addiction to feeling stress. It's, it's a crazy human phenomenon, you know, cause you'd think that we would be, um, we'd have an aversion to discomfort and we, we do in some ways, but we also have this compelling drive toward it because it's familiar. Yeah, I feel that's a very, very accurate evaluation. And to put my piece on that, it's that, so I remember a story a few years ago when I was just starting the business. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine who I met through the, uh, the Jack Cruz community, a really sweet guy named Nick. And he just gave such great advice. And I just remember telling him like, this is so hard. Like it is so hard, like being, 19 running a business like there's no path like all my friends and everyone went to college like they got the path they go to class and they go have fun and drink and party and and do sports and like there's a path there I'm like there's no path like i mean, there's no one i know who's my age who's running a business and trying to be nomadic or travel like and again but i chose it and in fact to your point like i didn't have to constantly be traveling for years i didn't have to be uh, even choosing to run a business at, um, and not even at the same time, <laughs> much less. But I did. Um, and at the time, I would have just said, well, I, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have a choice, like a choice, so to speak. But of course, I had a choice. I could have just set up shop in any one place and just been stable. But it's like I was sort of uh, choosing to stay in in suffering, but also in the unknown. Like I craved the unknown. Like I wanted the unknown. But I also was, was instead of owning up to it fully and being like, I want the unknown and I love it, which is now, and it always has been the truth. It was like, I want the unknown and I love it, but I'm too shy to say that out loud or even be honest with myself about it. And like, I'm so stressed because like, I'm, you know, trying to like, I don't know, I don't have a home base. Like it was just these stories I would just tell and tell and tell and tell. And like, I made my identity around that person. And it was just my choice to reaffirm, to reaffirm that, you know, uh, speaking of the unknown at the 
events, these dispensa events, one of the interesting things was at one point in the beginning, we were using these uh, vision board mind movie things, right? But then later on in the year, they weren't using them anymore. I was like, oh, like, that's interesting. And the, the what Dr. Joe kind of explained one day from the stage is that he realized like, you know, it's cool to like say, I want this and I want that and I am this and I am that in your mind movie. Like, it's cool to have those goals. And the overwhelming consensus was that like people eventually, because they realize that they can create anything. You know, he tells the stories of the people who have the mind movie and they're on their fourth mind movie because everything already came true from the first two or three. Like, can you imagine your dream house, your dream car, your dream partner, like blah, blah, blah. And now they just, and all of it ultimately goes back to like, people just literally wanted nothing more to, than to feel the unknown, like love. And looking at the, the untethered soul and the surrender experiment from, um, from Michael A. Singer, it's his other book where he explains his life story, which was constant surrender no matter what happened and always saying yes. If he felt his ego trying to resist something, just saying yes, I'd be happy to do that. You know, if someone asked something of him and he ended up running this multi-billion dollar company uh, going through horrible legal challenges the context during which he actually wrote The Untethered Soul. So like if you read The Surrender Experiment, understand the time in which he wrote The Untethered Soul, he was like literally uh, in a really precarious legal situation where he may have ended up in jail for the rest of his life, not because he did anything wrong, but because he was uh, basically wrongly accused of something in, in a company. And it's a really great story. I highly recommend it to anyone. But he was like, he is the living example. The book resonates so much because like he was the example. He wasn't a charlatan and just making stuff up or like Jesus talks about the Pharisees. They're hypocrites. You know, that was like one of the most common themes of the, the gospels was like the Pharisees. They're the hypocrites. They preach on the streets of these truths, but they're really living lies, you know? And so the, the takeaway, I, I asked this friend of mine who's a sort of in this, let's say, lineage of these Kriya Yoga masters that I mentioned earlier, the Russian Ayurvedic doctor. That's why I was over visiting Russia in September. And I asked him like, so I don't quite get it. Like on the one hand, I have these, some of these spiritual people teaching like manifest your dreams, create everything, boom, 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 which is super cool. And like empower people that way. Why not? Right. If it's possible, why not? And then you have Michael Singer on the other hand saying like, well, surrender, like just surrender to whatever life gives you. Like don't necessarily even try to like make this big dream and goal. And I would, I would actually go away from um, certain, you know, experiences in the spiritual world and feeling like I needed to like push to create my reality or to do something. And like, that was only my interpretation. That wasn't what was being t said per se. Um, but then the surrender experiment re resonated with me so deeply. I was like, wait, you don't have to force or fight. You can just surrender. And I was like, my version of creating my reality and living my best life is, is you know, let's say is actually being the person who can just surrender to whatever comes up to the best of my ability. Do I do that every day? No. Uh, would I like to? Eventually. But, you know, I have a lot of things that I am still attached to. I like the luxury of having a business and being able to go spend a couple months in Europe and explore. And that's like my my dream version of creating my reality, so to speak. But um, I just, I'm pointing out that all of that is to say that the unknown is for sure the place that we are afraid of. You're saying that we have this, we, we get in the discomfort, so that's why we don't break out. And it's like, but if, if and when, and this is one of the many reasons I love Joe Spencer. he's such an, in addition to being such a radiant guy, he just tells the truth. And like, you can feel it when he speaks the truth, because you know, he's from his story again, he has that power like Gandhi, that he's actually done it. He's done the work he's lived. You can just feel it. And that's why he's packing, you know, practically stadiums full of people. And uh, he says like, you know, like when you surrender to the unknown, he'll say, you know, for example, something like surrender to the unknown. And it's like the ride, the journey begins, like the date with the divine begins and like your life becomes this amazing, magical experience. But we have to be willing to surrender what we know, like Jesus taught in favor of something much greater. This podcast would not be possible without our friends over at Just Thrive Health, and they've been with the show for quite a while now, and one of the sponsors that I feel most grateful and proud to support and present to you. In so doing, I rarely like to clown on competitive products. It's not really my style to say, oh, this brand is the best and the rest of them suck. 
But I must be honest, uh, as someone who's tried to fix my gut <laughs> in numerous ways, especially with a lot of very expensive probiotics over the years, I have to say that most probiotics I've ever tried were a complete waste of time, energy, and money, with the exception of the Just Thrive probiotic. What makes Just Thrive probiotics so special is that they're spore-based, and this allows them to survive the treacherous journey into your GI tract where they can make themselves at home and do what they're supposed to do. And for this reason, it's a really unique and incredible product. It's also something kids at just about any age can take. Parents can sprinkle it into the food or drinks of little ones. It can also be baked or fried up to 455 degrees and still retain 100% potency. Isn't that crazy? It's also ideal for pregnant moms to be to support a healthy microbiome for themselves and their babies. You know, newborns get their first big dose of microbes at birth while traveling through the birth canal. It also contains a very special strain of bacteria that can maintain its effectiveness when taken with antibiotics. Now talk about crazy awesome. You know, that's one of the issues when you're taking antibiotics, if you're in a position to have to do so, is that they're going to ultimately uh, cause some dysbiosis, to say the least. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it politely there. So I'm one, again, who wasted so much money trying to take probiotics during a cycle of antibiotics, which is probably futile. However, it's not with Just Thrive spore-based probiotics. So if you want to check this out, I highly recommend that you do. So if you want to get your hands on some of these Just Thrive probiotics, here's what you do. Go to justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. That's justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. And of course, we've got a discount for you. It's 15%. And the code there is Luke15 at justthrivehealth.com. So with that, would you like to return to this original <laughs> question? <laughs> It, I was so glad that it was you this morning and I didn't have any notes or like any framework of reference <laughs> at all. And I was like, I don't totally don't need to with Matt because I know we'll just shoot the shit and hopefully some golden nuggets will, um, you know, emerge from that. And they definitely have. But yeah, I'm like personally curious as, as, um, as I said, I just moved right finally. I mean, I've moved a couple of times in the past year, first to Texas, then into a temporary apartment while we worked in this house, the house that I just moved. And I realized I have so much shit, bro, like boxes and boxes of extension cords and biohacking things. And if you saw the supplements in my kitchen, I think I'm going to like make a video of it because it's so ridiculous. I mean, largely because um, the work I do, a lot of people send me stuff and I want to try it out. So I throw it in the corner and eventually do. But I have so much stuff. And when I look at your lifestyle, I literally like... I'm so attached to the things that I, you know, that, that quote unquote belong to me temporarily uh, because you can't take it with you. Um, so it's not like a materialism in the sense like, ooh, I have to have the new big screen TV and the Porsche. I'm, I've never really been that guy, but I just tend to accumulate things that are just creature comforts, right? They just kind of make things easier, you know, like I, I just ordered on Amazon that I'd need this new like handheld Black & Decker little vacuum you know because every once in a while the there's like buster. yeah you yeah, know what i'm saying things. i'm like that type of shit you know just utilitarian things that i think make life more convenient but ultimately become um a hindrance when it comes time to move and organize and things and i look at your lifestyle and i think i literally i don't think i could do that i think i'm too attached to all my gadgets and all my toys and tools to just like take a laptop and go on the road and run my life from there seems terrifying like what if I need that one supplement? Like, ah, oh, I got a sore throat. I need my iodine spray. Well, we don't have that in Costa Rica. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just so attached yeah. to my stuff. And I'm not faulting myself for that. It's just kind of a self-awareness. And when I see someone living a lifestyle that's so contrasted in that regard, although we're aligned on so many other things, I just think, how do you do that? Like, when I go on a vacation, I just went on a, on a trip to, um, on a boat and you know, they said pack light. And I'm like, light packing for me is like heavy packing for your average person. And I have all this shit and I'm on this boat and I'm like, do I really need all this stuff? And I did. Like I used most of the things, you know, whatever they were. You know, you need three pairs of shorts because what if the one gets lost, you know, et cetera. Um, but the prospect of just cruising around with a backpack and a laptop, I see people like you do that. I'm like, how the hell do you do that? So yeah. that's, that's my question. Like, do you actually like have an apartment anywhere? Do you have a storage unit? Do you own shit? Or have you just, speaking of untethered, have you untethered yourself from all physical 
you know, possessions and are just like living that lean as you appear to be? So no, I have, I have stuff. I own things. Um, I, as I understand it, you know, we would have to be willing to let go of those things to be truly free. Like you can have the dust buster and enjoy it, but maintaining <laughs> the consciousness that like, it's not even yours and it's going to be gone eventually anyway. So I feel very fortunate that unintentionally my life became like a great teacher to force me, so to speak, to learn these lessons young and quickly. And yes, the hardest, the single hardest thing I've done in the last uh, four years, uh, five years now running the business uh, was not uh, running or doing anything with the business. It's actually packing and unpacking has been at any point that I needed to pack, unpack or repack emotionally, mentally, spiritually. That has been the most demanding task by quite a bit, actually. And I'm not sure why other than that there is this like deep sense of surrender that I have to be willing to make if I'm going to go somewhere for many months and like basically just, I go through every single item and I apply tremendous amounts of energy to like, do I need this or do I want this or on what grounds do I even take? I mean, everything in my life has become a question of like, on what grounds does one make decisions? Because given like by the time I was 18, had enough income to be able to go wherever I want and do whatever I want. So like that's done. Total location freedom, not necessarily time freedom because I've had to run the business, but like, you know, working on that part, the time freedom part, but location freedom and financial freedom for like, I'm not, you know, wouldn't buy Lamborghinis like left and right, but just um, to be able to do the things I'd want to do. Like, you know, Tim Ferriss had like the target monthly income in the four hour work week. I'm like, set something that seemed reasonable. And it's like made it, you know? So it's like, that's pretty good. Um, the question always became like in every situation, packing my bag, going to live somewhere, or be somewhere, um, being with people or not being with people, eating a certain diet. Like the question has always come back to for me on what grounds does one make any decisions in this world? Like not, it's not, it's not what is the right decision. Cause I've come to a place where I don't believe there is per se a right decision, but the question is just like, how does anyone make any decisions at all given unlimited choices completely? And the best answer I've been able to come to so far is like, you just, it's funny because it's like a common cliche, but it's like you are best served by following your heart. But to break that down a little bit more, because that didn't mean anything to me for a long time from with the context of our conversation that we've gone super deep into, I would have to get to a place of that, like the best outcome would be to get to a place of like, how do I want my whole life to be? Like, how do I want my whole life to be? Abundance, love, joy, get to that state and get through whatever I have to get through to get to that state and then make the decisions from that place of that clarity, perspective, the witness, as Michael Singer would call it, you know, the true awareness and not with all the wavering, the, the mind or the ego, but just that true, clear perspective. And that's when it's like, it's crazy because I'll get sometimes to that state and I'll feel like, and it's a good feeling, but like, the same feeling that I would feel if I had like a crush on a girl and I had to talk to her in, in like middle school, you know, like that, like it's actually like a sympathetic as Dispenza describes it, a sympathetic arousal that starts in the lower energy centers. And, but it's a warmth. It's not like bad. It feels good. It's like, Ooh, it's like butterflies or like cooties or whatever that feeling is. It's like, <laughs> it's warming. And you, you know, I think you get what I'm getting at and it's like excitement. It's like true visceral excitement. And that's like, that's when I know I'm on the right path. I, and people say, go with your gut. Like I've only experienced that a few times, a handful of times in my life that I've actually, it's not, I've just for the first time connected together. When people say, go with your gut, that's the feeling they're describing because you feel it in your gut and like your heart chakra center. And so because if the decision's made from that place, I also, I'll, I'll feel this like, this is the best feeling. I love when I get there. It's like, am I allowed to do that? Like that sounds so, and it's like, break. it's like I've broken the upper limit. It's like something feels so good that I'm like, is that legal? Like, can I actually be that happy? Like, am I allowed, like I actually sometimes have worried that like, like the law was going to come after me for being too happy, you know, like seriously, that it just wouldn't be legal. And they're actually seemingly working on that now, but that's a different <laughs> conversation. But, um, so, so anyway, as far as the packing, like the packing's hard for me because I, if I don't do it from that higher state, I end up like bringing all this stuff. And it's like, do I decide what I need? Well, I don't really need anything. So if I go off, what do I need? I'm not going to bring anything. Do I want it? Well, yeah, I want it, but I might want to bring a lot of things. So there's some balance of like what's practical, what makes sense, what will be better to just leave behind and, you know, take extra cash and bring it on the road 
uh, and buy it if I need it when I get to wherever I'm going to be. And, and then like I accumulate stuff. So then I have to unpack and repack again, like every couple of weeks or like month, more likely every couple of months. Um, I do have an apartment, but I didn't for like three or four years, which was difficult. And I found that for me, maybe not for everyone, but to be super nomadic, the idea of having an anchor, it's just all energy, right? So like I had to get to a place and this was very difficult. And I went through like a serious heartbreak situation that led me to this point to like, say like, I was in so much, my heart was so open, but I was in so much like heart pain that I finally was willing to say like, Matt, like I'll do anything to take care of you. Like speaking to myself, almost like from the witness to the third person of my, my, let's say person label, Matt, I got to this place where I finally was like in so, so vulnerable that I was, it took so much pain to break through to like, I need to put myself first, finally, no matter the money. Cause it was always, it was always, again, a scarcity and worry about the money. That was like my challenge to overcome for other people. It's different. You know, like, uh, there's a quote, every man's burden is the heaviest. It doesn't quite apply here exactly, but it's like, you know, for other people, you were saying for them, their challenge is the, the Rolexes and the Ferraris. But for you, your level of challenge might be like the creature comforts and overcoming that. Whereas for someone else, it might be overcoming like the billions or whatever they're spending on different things. So I finally just said like, it doesn't matter about the money. Like the money is going to be fine. I'm going to get a place for myself to like have a home, like a, a place to be based. And I'm going to, and even if I'm, and I had to make the deal with myself, like even if I'm gone 10 months of the year, even if I'm gone 12 months of the year, I'm not going to guilt myself. And, and I like put an energy cause it's energy first. So I put an anchor in the field. Like how great would it feel to know that I could go anywhere in the world. And if I'm pooped, I can catch a direct flight back to wherever I want to be to my home and be there and safe. And there is a pre previously I did have a storage unit for some time, which was a great start compared to not having a storage unit. And before that I had like stuff that was with my, at my parents' house. But so I do believe like at the minimum for someone to have a storage unit makes sense if they're nomadic. And then you should, you just have to be really intentional and conscious about what you're doing each step of the way. Uh, for me and the level of what I'm doing, like running a business to have a place that I actually know I can fall back to and like sleep in a bed and have a cozy space for, it doesn't have to be super crazy, fancy, and nice. I mean, for me, I wanted it to be a place that I'd be very happy to go back to. But finally, leading with energy led me back to the right uh, place where the home kind of opened itself to me. And yeah, and it's been so nice. Like to be gone, it was, for the first time, I was gone for seven months traveling, for, but five months in Europe, two months in Costa Rica. But I enjoyed it. I felt much more because I had done myself that favor of saying like, I'm going to have a home so that if I felt like some stress or some challenges, because inevitably they do, that's part of why travel is so awesome because like it forces you to grow and overcome yourself. And that's why I love it so much. Uh, but I knew if I needed to, I could always go back to my place. But I didn't because it was like, I knew I had it. And somehow knowing that I had it was like enough for me to be like, no, I'm good. Like, and I'm just going to keep going on this epic adventure. And I met like some amazing people. While I was traveling in Europe. I visited some really good friends um, in Russia, in Turkey, in Italy, in Germany. Like buddy of mine's the second most expensive uh, soccer player in the whole world. He's like the the next Ronaldo, basically. He plays for a huge German team and all the clubs in England and Spain want him and I visit him in Germany. It's like, that was like the the cherry on top of an already amazing trip. But if I hadn't, you know, kind of been willing to kind of push through some of my challenging emotions that were all internal anyway, I wouldn't have been able to get to, let's say, some of the amazing experiences that I was blessed with. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out here. So great to see you. And I'm so glad we recorded this because I, I know if you and I had just sat down and we're just like catching up, we would have had the exact same conversation. Yeah, for sure. So the fact that we get to record it and share some of the insights that, that you're uh, uh, arriving at in your journey is really, really special. So thank you so much. And it's been fun to see you when I met you. I think you were 19. Uh, I was 18. You were 18. First time we met. Yeah, I just turned eighteen. For those that haven't heard the story, I, I did a speaking gig at um, in New York City, and Matt was there, and he comes up to me afterward, and he's like, "Hey, man, I should be on your podcast." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, like, who are you?" And he started busting out stuff about light and magnetism and EMF and all this, and I was like, "Holy shit, this dude is smart. He's super cool." And so we did it, you know. And then thank you to see, you know, how you've just grown and evolved, and uh, and and to watch you kind of what you described here today is, you know, moving a bit out of the physical into the metaphysical and just seeing how that's enriched your life is really beautiful to watch. So thank you for sharing all that today. Thank you so much, Luke. I appreciate it. And I'll just, I'll just close with saying that, 
you know, Luke actually has a very special place in my heart and in my life and business as well, because it was that same night. Not only did that podcast, it came out six months later after Paleo FX 2018, where we had a booth and I think you were speaking and so on. But that same night, you had asked to my friend Brian and I, where did you guys get those cool shades? And we had had them custom made. And so I told you, yeah, I'll connect you, with, connect you with this tinting company. And we had about five or six emails back and forth and it was really difficult. And I had seen an article about how to tint your own glasses with this particular tint. And that's when I finally said to you, like, you know what, like, we'll just do it for you. Just send me your glasses. And your 70 bucks you, you paid on September 3rd, I think 2017, was the first income raw optics ever had. And then I used that to buy the, the hot plate and the beaker and the tint bottle that we used to tint the first pair that we used to tint the subsequent next hundred pairs that we used to buy more hot plates and beakers. And we started it all in the garage. But truly, if it weren't for your sort of divine request of that particular need, it the business probably wouldn't exist. I mean, it'd be something different, but it wouldn't exist as it does now. So, That's so I owe cool. you a huge thanks. Luke. You know, it's crazy. I still have and wear that same pair. That's so I, awesome. I'm like, I can't believe I haven't lost them. See, I'm, so great. see the it's way so I'm with, with trinkets and shit. Like I, I hang on to it. But yeah, they're awesome. I get compliments on them all the time. Oh, let me get some of those. I'm like, no, oh, they were just a custom pair Matt made for me. So yeah, thanks, dude. Thank well, you, Luke. Good to see you, man. Good, thank you enough. Yeah. You're the best, brother. Enjoy uh, enjoy your time here in Austin. Hopefully we get to spend a little more time before you split. Amen. Same to you. Cheers. God bless. Take care, everyone. Okay, podcast friends, the bar is closed. As they say, we don't care where you go, but you can't stay here. Well, at least that's what they say in the world's grimiest dive bars. I love Matt so much, and I'm guessing if you made it this far, you share that sentiment. He's not only super bright and knowledgeable, but he's also just such a gem of a human. I just love that kid. I can call him a kid because he's, I, he probably could be his dad, actually. I'm 51. He's early 20s. Do the math. It could work out. But he's just an awesome man. Let me put it like that. If you ever listen to this, Matt, I see as a kid, but also as a man, okay? Don't worry about it. As a side note, Matt also advised me on launching my own blue blocking eyewear company, Gilded, which in itself says a lot since that's exactly what his company does. In other words, he doesn't live by the competition scarcity mindset, which I find really refreshing. And I fully support his mission. His glasses are awesome and I still wear mine from time to time. You can get yourself some of these badass raw optics glasses by visiting lukestory.com slash raw optics. And if you use the code Luke over there, Matt's going to give you 10% off. Okay, on to next week's episode. This is one about which I am very excited. Ironically or not, it's show 420, bro, with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, otherwise known as Guru Dev. It's called A Mystic Speaks, Reincarnation, Past Lives, and Spiritual Simplicity. And I got to say, uh, I was blown away by his presence and the grounded nature of his teachings. And since the interview next week is a bit shorter than usual, we've also included a very deep 20-minute meditation he created at the end of the show. So make sure to subscribe to the Lifestylist podcast on your podcast app so next week's show hits your feed right away. And if you want me to email the audio, show notes link, and video for every show, I just need your email address. To get on the podcast release list, all you need to do is visit lukestory.com slash newsletter and enter your name and email. It takes about 30 seconds. I'm going to fire that off to you every Tuesday. Okay, I'm out. Blessing to you and yours until we meet again. <laughs>